So hi guys and welcome to lesson six, which is the final lesson of the geochemical data series. So in this lesson, I'm going to be talking about common stable isotopes and a couple common examples uh, that apply to geological systems. So a stable isotope is an isotope that does not decay. So these are not radioactive isotopes and they're not radiogenic isotopes. These are stable in nature, stable isotopes. And they can fractionate in a couple of ways that we can measure, and I'll give examples of this in the following slides. So firstly, we have what's known as mass-dependent fractionation, or MDF. MDF is the process that fractionates or separates uh, isotopes, and the degree of fractionation between the isotopes scales with the mass of the isotopes themselves. Mass-independent fractionation, or MIF, is different to mass-dependent fractionation in that the isotopes do not fractionate in a way that scales with the individual masses of the isotopes. So there's a process that's essentially violating mass fractionation law, and I'll discuss an example of that in the following slides as well. So stable isotopes are becoming increasingly used in geological purposes. Um, so you, you know, there are things like iron isotopes, copper isotopes, titanium isotopes, um, but perhaps the most commonly used stable isotopes in geological systems are oxygen, sulfur. Let me give examples of oxygen and sulfur, as that's the that's the systems I'm more familiar with myself. So oxygen isotopes. I'll give some basics, and I'll give uh, a bit more detail in the following slide. Um, there are three naturally occurring. Um, oxygen stable isotopes that I've given with their percent abundance in the world to the left. So you see we have oxygen 16 is, is largely dominant in the um, oxygen system. Then we have oxygen 17 and then oxygen 18. And these isotopes undergo mass dependent fractionation whereby the lighter isotopes will separate from the heavier isotopes. Simple. So mass dependent variations, so the way we essentially quantify the mass dependent variations uh, are described by the ratio of oxygen 18 to oxygen 16 and we use the equation that I've, I've listed here just under the different oxygen isotopes so uh, so here is our delta notation this is often how um, isotopic system variations are reported and then this equals the um, the ratio of the sample so the oxygen 18 oxygen 16 ratio in the sample uh, compared with the oxygen 18 oxygen 16 ratio in the standard and we typically standardize to mean seawater um, so you know I'll take this diagram firstly so as you can see there's some processes going on here um, we're not looking particularly at rocks we're more looking at the the atmosphere or hydrosphere um, so as you can see in the ocean um, so we have our delta notation here for our for our oxygen 18 mass dependent fractionations as we can see it's zero because this is our standard and then we have evaporation and then instantly, right, we have negative values. So we've had quite a large degree of fractionation just during the evaporation process. So take a moment to think of why that is. I've already said that, you know, lighter isotopes will fractionate from heavier isotopes. So why then do we have such a negative value here? And this negative value continues during precipitation, right? So we have negative three in the rain um, and then the vapor in clouds and things, negative 15 negative 11, so on and so forth. So what you might notice is that everything up here is negative, okay? So all meteorite waters have negative variations since the lighter isotopes will partition into the vapors and fluids a lot easier than the heavy isotopes. So what that means is we leave heavier isotopes behind and we enrich um, vapor phases, such as what we're doing in this process, in the lighter isotopes. So, you know, we're essentially enriching um, the, the atmosphere from the hydrosphere in oxygen 16 isotopes and that's causing these these negative values and then take this diagram to the right this is something that most geologists are familiar with where we have a subduction zone here is our subducting slab here is our mantle wedge these are some melts that have been liberated from the subducting slab uh, and then we have our overlying continental crust so firstly take oceanic crust let's take it as a whole where we can see we have slight positive um, delta 18 oxygen notation of around 9 and 4. We can see that the mantle also has a, a positive oxygen isotope composition around 5.5 per mil. And then the Archean crust has around 8. And then sediments have slightly more. So now what we're noticing on a whole is that all the rocks that we're concerned with, so we're not concerned with precipitation and vapour, so on and so forth, but the rocks and the melts that we're concerned with all have positive delta 18 oxygen, albeit variable, but they have positive. 
So crusts, um, so essentially silicate magmas and the mantle have narrow positive values and the crust and sediments have heavy signatures and the reason that the sediments and the continental crust have heavier signatures is during low temperature interaction with the hydrosphere where we have high fractionation factors of the lighter isotopes partitioning into any waters that interact with the sediments and the rocks. In geology, we can use that delta-18 oxygen composition uh, of rocks and minerals, such as zircons, uh, to tell us things about magma source, contamination, mixing, and hydrothermal alteration. So firstly, we'll take a look at the diagram to the far right, which is normalised to V-SMO, which is the Vienna, you know, it's, it's, it's the ocean water, as we've, as we've discussed previously. And then just below that, we have our meteoric water, which you can see is the only um, one on this diagram that has a significantly variable negative value as well. So that could be quite important, okay? Firstly, let's have a look at mantle rocks and um, products of mantle melting. You know, you have mobs and basalts and things like that. You can see that they all sort of fall around this narrow range of 5 to 5.5 per mil uh, delta oxygen. And then we get to sedimentary rocks. We have diatoms, carbonates, pelagic clays, sandstones, etc. And as you can see, there's no overlap in the oxygen isotope composition of these rocks with the mantle range. And that's because these sedimentary rocks typically form in, in water, typically form in seawater. And so um, the lighter isotopes are preferentially removed from these rocks um, as they're pushed into the fluid or into the vapour during evaporation. And that's why we result in sediments having a variable but generally quite high delta 18 oxygen values when compared to mean seawater averages. So then if we take another look at this, knowing that sediments have high oxygen 18 values, knowing that, precip that precipitated waters have low oxygen 18 values and that mantle and mantle derived rocks plot somewhere in the middle, if we have a mantle derived rock, so a basalt or a gabbro or something, and this has quite positive um, delta 18 oxygen values, much more positive than we'd expect for mantle-derived magmas, we can infer that potentially that this parent magma has assimilated or become contaminated with sedimentary rocks that have a much higher delta 18 oxygen value. And then we get to the diagram in the middle. So we have our familiar radiogenic isotope system of strontium isotopes at the bottom, where we have radiogenic strontium 87 over stable strontium 86. And then we have delta 18 oxygen per mil on the y-axis as well. So if we cast our minds back to strontium isotopes, um, radioactive rubidium 87 concentrates in the crust, and that means the crust becomes preferentially enriched in strontium 87 relative to strontium 86, purely because strontium 86 is less compatible in crustal rocks relative to radioactive rubidium. And I'll refer to you to the previous lesson uh, if you want to get a bit more information regarding that. So what that means is that mantle rocks and mantle derived rocks generally have quite low strontium 87-86 ratios, whereas crustal rocks generally have quite high strontium 87-86 ratios. Now, if we plot that against our oxygen delta notation, we can see that actually not only can we determine between mantle rocks, crustal rocks, and mantle rocks that have become contaminated with crustal rocks, but we can also determine between slightly different rock types and slightly different tectonic environments, where we can begin to look at altered oceanic crusts. So see, we've had interaction between mafic, ultramafic rocks and fluids. And what that means is that the lighter isotopes are preferentially incorporated into the fluids. That increases the delta-18 oxygen value of the amount of derived magmas, such as basaltic rocks. But also they can be much higher when we start to incorporate things like carbonates and diatoms in cherts, limestones, etc, etc. And now moving on to sulphur isotopes, and in some ways they operate very similarly to oxygen isotopes. So there are four naturally occurring sulphur isotopes of 32, 33, 34 and 36. There is a sulphur 35 which is cosmogenic. Um, and these can undergo mass dependent and mass independent fractionation during geological processes. So mass dependent fractionation, so MDF, let's discuss this first. So these are variations are typically described by the ratio of sulfur 34 to sulfur 32, much like oxygen 18 and oxygen 16 in the previous example. And we use the equation to the top to the top right here. Sorry, top left, that's a bit silly. Use this equation to the top right here. So you know we can replace this x with the isotope of our choice, so 33, 36, or 34. But as I said, the most common is 34. 
And that's because if we take a look at the different isotopic abundances of these, we have 32, which is our larger one. And then we have oxygen 34, which is our next largest one. So these are the easiest ones to measure. That's why they're most commonly measured. And then we have 33 and 36. So, and then we take this equation up here. So we replace our X with 34, essentially. And just as with the equation for oxygen, we have our 34-32 sulfur ratio of our sample over the 34-32 sulfur ratio of our standard. Isotopic variations typically follow mass-dependent fractionation. So as isotopic variation scales with the mass of the isotopes. And here I've got an example of delta 34s, which we just plug in our 34 here, and delta 33s, where we just plug in our 33 here. And what that means is that we generate this linear array of mass-dependent fractionation, and this is referred to as the terrestrial mass fractionation array. The fractionation factor is essentially the equation of this curve, which is around 0 0.515, and that's what we're getting here. So that's the mass fractionation line exponent, which is denoted as lambda here. And there's the equations again, just to show you how this is derived. So what you can see is that if we've undergone mass dependent fractionation, they shouldn't violate mass fractionation law. And that's why when we see 10, it should fall approximately on five for delta 33. So now I'll give an example of mass dependent fractionation. Delta 34 sulfur are the most widely used sulfur isotopes for geological systems. Um, and this is because the values of the mantle and mantle derived rocks are around zero. Yet sedimentary rocks have highly variable delta 34 values. And this is because biologically mediated reduction of sulfate to sulfide causes large mass fractionations in the delta 34 sulfur isotope value. A word of caution there is that bacteria only began to operate from around 2.7 billion years ago. So rocks younger than this generally have very variable delta 34 sulfur values, whereas rocks before this, so sedimentary rocks prior to 2.7 billion years ago, so Archean sediments, have delta 34 sulfur values that are very similar to mantle rocks. So now let's give an example. So as I've said, mantle rocks and mantle derived rocks, if they haven't undergone any contamination, should have delta 34 sulfur values of around zero. However, we get to marine sediments and we get to seawater and evaporite deposits and we have highly variable delta 34 sulfur values. So as you can imagine, if we have a mantle derived rock, so a basalt or something, and it doesn't interact with the crust, it will crystallize and we will analyze it and it will have a delta 34 sulfur value of around zero. However, if that mantle derived magma has a much more variable delta 34 isotopic sulfur signature, probably interacted or become contaminated with um, a sedimentary rock that has a vastly different delta 34 sulfur value. That However, if this mantle derived magma was emplaced into Archean sediments, we wouldn't be able to tell from delta 34 if it's interacted with those Archean sediments, purely because the Archean sediments will have a similar delta 34 sulfur value to the mantle rocks themselves. So now we have to find a different way of being able to determine if a magma has assimilated Archean sediments. And mass independent fractionation arises when isotopic fractionation does not obey mass fractionation laws. So the degree of fractionation does not scale with the mass of the isotopes. So I'm just going to go to the previous slide again. So here we have our terrestrial mass fractionation array where, e where each of these points, um, you know, they abide by mass fractionation laws. If one, of these, if one of these points plots off of this terrestrial mass fractionation array, it's probably undergone some degree of mass independent fractionation. And then we quantify the distance of our point from our terrestrial fractionation array, and we denote it via this uppercase delta x sulfur by this equation. So take 33 sulfur and 34 sulfur. Deviations from the terrestrial mass fractionation array are denoted with uppercase delta, and we plug in using this equation here. And this is the plot that we're seeing here. And this is a widely used plot in sulfur isotope studies, and it's pretty spectacular, actually, with what it's telling us. So I'll give a bit of information first. So if there is no mass independent fractionation, then the delta 33 sulfur values will be zero. However, non-zero 33 sulfur values, these are points that don't lie on that terrestrial mass fractionation array. These are caused by photochemical reactions with ultraviolet rays in the atmosphere prior to the great oxidation event at 2.4. Therefore, sedimentary rocks that have interacted with the atmosphere uh, prior to 2.4 billion years old can record mass independent fractionation values, so non-zero 
uh, uppercase delta 34 sulfur values, okay? And now this can tell us about archaean contamination. So now I'll get to this diagram where on the x-axis we're going from as old as we can to the present day, and then at the y-axis we have this uppercase delta 33 sulfur value. And as we can see from around 2.4 through the Vanerozoic, all these values are around zero. And that's because we're now in an oxygen rich atmosphere and this sulfur isotope isn't undergoing mass independent fractionation. However, you go older than 2.4 billion years old and we start seeing some rather large variations. And that's because this represents an oxygen poor atmosphere and that mass independent fractionation of sulfur isotopes is operating. So now if we take an Archean rock at around 2.7 or 2.8 billion years old, whatever you want, um, and we take our mantle-derived magma, if our mantle-derived magma has a delta-34 sulfur value of zero, if it interacts with Archean rocks, the delta-34 sulfur value won't change, but its uppercase delta-33 sulfur value will change if the Archean rock has non-zero sulfur isotope values. So I hope you found this helpful. Stay in the loop by clicking subscribe. Um, and thank you for watching this series. Appreciate it.